Okay, so I'm going to start and just by introducing myself once again. My name is Samantha, Samantha Libanzu. I am the Vice Chair of the CIPD in Manchester. I'm also their Inclusion and Diversity Lead. I'm really excited today because we have an amazing award-winning speaker who's just going to blow us away. I'm pretty sure I have gone to her sessions. They're incredible. So you're in for a treat. I'm just going to introduce her shortly, but Winnie, I want to make sure that I pronounce your name correctly. I've got Anna Forson. So Winnie Anna Forson, award-winning speaker, excited for you to really get what she's got to say about supporting the progression of Black and ethnic, ethnically diverse talent as allies. This is such an important topic. And I hear lots of people saying it's a, it's a, there's lots of noise around it and lots, it's a hot topic, but the actual truth of it is it's a real topic you know, with real people who are actually really being affected. So we're going to make sure that this is something that you get some real good takeaways away from today. So I'm going to just say next slide, just to get everyone started. Of course, we want to start with some general housekeeping. This session is going to be recorded. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it is a topic that is really, really true to the hearts. And we want to make sure we have the opportunity to share this wider than those that could, were able to join today. We will therefore share the links to the slides and the recording after the session. Please use the chat function. You will see that the team who have joined today are Steve Berry, who is our ambassador today. Don't know if you can just put your little wave on there on the screen. <laughs> um, he is in the chat and he's there to support us today. We've got Rebecca, who is our committee um, administrator and everything, whiz on everything. She's brilliant and she's here to support as well. And we also have Emma Clayton. Her screen is off because she has internet-ish challenges, but she's there also, one of our amazing team leads on, if you ever watched the HR Book Club, she's the one there that's running that incredible, uh, talented individuals there. So please keep your microphones muted, please, because um, we are recording it. We will have opportunities at the very end for questions. Winnie's excited to hear what comes out of today. As I mentioned, our guest speaker, she is going to be taking over shortly. Um, next slide, just to continue with a little bit more housekeeping. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the Zoom two bars. I'm hoping that everyone is clued up on it. But um, as mentioned, mute your microphones. There is an off and on button on the left hand, left hand side. And if you need transcript, which is just started to run now, it's hopefully everyone should be able to see that if it's needed. Anyone who has reactions, hands up, agree or disagree, clap and thumbs up is there. Please make use of it. You know, if you agree with something, we want to, when he wants to see that this is, you know, you're engaged, please do use those um, reactions. We want to see that you are engaged on this um, power hour, shall we call it. Can you do the next slide, if that's okay? I'm now going to pass it over to the amazing Winnie. I, I, as, as I mentioned, this is a, a really, really, really great session. So keep your ears up and ready to hear what she's got to say. Thank you, Winnie. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Samantha. And thank you all so much for sacrificing your lunch time to hear my dulcet tones over the next hour. It's just such a pleasure to be with you all. And I've got a special place in my heart for Manchester. I see many of you in the chat saying, I'm from Manchester, which is great. Um, Everyone who knows me really well knows if I had the opportunity, I would prefer to live in Manchester than Hertfordshire, where I currently am. Um, I was in Manchester for three years for my degree, and Mancunians are some of the best people I have ever met. So really, really to be with you. Um, to introduce myself, um, I'm a Vice President looking after diversity and inclusion um, within UK, Europe and Middle East for a global um, bank. Um, and I always say that's my day job, but by night, I'm the co-founder of Accelerate Black Teachers, which is an organisation um, that we launched about last year now. So I can't believe it's been a year already, but essentially our focus is to ensure as much as possible that we are dispelling some of the myths around challenges that Black and ethnically diverse talent faced in the marketplace um, for talent, but also to support organisations to help them embrace and create more of a culture of belonging for this population. Um, I'm Ghanaian by um, ethnicity, so I grew up in Ghana in West Africa. Um, I'm a quarter Dutch. Everyone does ask me, are you mixed race or are you just, you know, a lighter skinned Ghanaian? I'm a quarter Dutch, um, so I'm, I'm of mixed ethnicity. 
Um, and I'm very passionate about um, this topic, both, both from a lived experience, but also because I think um, we all have a responsibility um, as allies, which is going to be one of the focus areas for the session today, to create an opportunity for all individuals to thrive, regardless of how they identify themselves. And I've got two daughters, they are four and three, and one of my biggest passions is to ensure that they, they have a world that's better than the one I found um, for them. So, it, it, you know, it's a very important topic um, to my heart. And, and to make sure that you're all here in the right session, looking at the right topics, essentially we have four objectives for this session. So if at the end of the hour we can say we have achieved all of these four things, if we can all just give me a clap emoji at the end of the session, I would be grateful. Um, but essentially we're here to understand the landscape and business case for progressing ethnically diverse talent. Like Sam said, it's a very big hot topic right now, mostly in the wake of um, the tragic murder of George Floyd. More organizations are thinking about about what they can do to drive inclusion, not just for black individuals, but also across um, our kind of ethnically diverse talent, talent pool. So I'm, I'm here to talk a bit about that. I'd also like to explore some of the barriers for progression. What are the things that are really holding people back from progressing within organizations? And how can we as allies um, create more environments that are conducive to seeing ethnically diverse talent grow? So we'll talk about some really practical ways um, that allies can help in this space um, and, and then hopefully be able to leave you with some real solutions that you can take back and share um, within your organizations. Please do interact. Um, Sam mentioned the emojis. I'm a huge fan of emojis, so please use them to your heart's content and hopefully I see lots flurry throughout the session. But more importantly, keep interacting in the chat functionality. Um, if you have any questions, please just pop them in and I'll do my best to answer them as I go through. But I will make sure I leave ample time for Q&A at the end um, to make sure no one leaves with a question unanswered. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll get a lot of value from the session today. So I'm going to start a little bit by talking about Accelerate Black Futures. Why did we create it? Like I said before, there is a huge disparity around ethnically diverse talent and, and also black talent where we see a lot of organization pop organizations probably struggle more with in this space. And we have four pillars in the way that we do our work. So the first is educating people and equipping individuals with the knowledge and expertise they require. We aim to inspire confidence, provide really practical tools. Um, so it's things like, how do you actually have a performance review? We really get down to the granular level of helping people understand how they can either drive positive change or be able to feel um, like they have a catalyst in their career to excel as professionals and, and accelerate in their careers. But we're also very passionate about giving back. We are a CIC. So what that means is that a lot of the work that we do is free um, for our members. Um, but then we also create opportunities for people to invest their time into what we do. And we encourage people who are part of our community to give back as well. And we do that through a few different ways. So the first is through our Career Accelerator Program, um, which helps to provide equity for people within their own career trajectories. We do monthly scale up events. Um, so both of these interventions are free, um, which allow colleagues um, from black and ethnically diverse communities to come and see inspirational role models um, and learn and learn from them. Um, we also do lots of online activities, so please do look us up um, via our website or on LinkedIn to connect with us. And we also work with different groups on more bespoke activity. So that's that on the introductions. What is the landscape for ethnically diverse talent? What is the actual kind of challenge that we see? I often have people say to me, Winnie, I just don't understand where people are hiding. I really want to hire really great people for these roles, but I can't find anyone. And actually, there are real big issues in this space. So as of last year, there were no FTSE 100 firms who had black executives in their top three roles. So there is a very, very prevalent issue around um, representation. We also see that black and ethnically diverse individuals struggle to achieve the same progression um, as, as their white counterparts. Um, and that's, that's definitely come through as an emerging theme from the McGregor Smith review. So if you haven't seen that report, it's actually a great report and I really recommend that you go and read it. Um, but we also see that while a lot of organizations will typically have a broader representation and more junior levels of the organizations um, that we're in, we see that only one in 16 top management positions are held by ethnically diverse talent. 
So there is a huge disparity between entry level roles and where we see representation. But then we start to see that tail off quite a bit when you get into senior management positions. And we'll explore um, what some of the reasons are for that as we go through the session. Um, over 30% of Black Africans and Black Caribbean employees reported that they were overlooked for promotions. So I hear a lot of leaders tell me, Winnie, I want to see people grow, but I feel like the people in my teams don't always put their hands up. And actually, the truth is many colleagues do want to progress. They do want those opportunities, but they feel like they are overlooked for them. So I think there's a really great win for organizations to think about how you tap into your talent, even if they're not shouting out for those opportunities. Um, and then the last point I'd like to raise is that black employees hold just 1.5% of senior roles in the UK, according to a HR review piece of research. So that's, I mean, it's just, there are significant issues in this space. And hopefully we'll be able to dispel some of the challenges around that as we go through the session. I'd love to hear in the chat, do some of these stats surprise you? Um, are they similar to what you thought? Please do keep sharing your thoughts as we go along. I'd love to hear. Um, um, anything on your mind. Um, so why is this group of talents so important for organizations to tap into? Um, research shows us, once again, the McGregor Smith review shows us that the potential benefit to the UK economy from full representation of black and ethnically diverse individuals across the labor market is estimated to be 24 billion pounds per year. So many of us think about the moral argument or the ethical argument for having black and ethnically diverse talent in our organizations. But actually, if we get this right, think about the exponential, um, I guess, capital and increase in revenue that most organizations can tap into. And this isn't just prevalent for talent. It's also prevalent for customers. The more diverse we're able to think as businesses, for the way we attract customers and also for the way we attract and retain talent, the more revenue we'll be able to generate. And Boston Consulting Group, for example, validates this research um, through a report that they were able to, um, to do a few years ago that tells us that most companies saw a 19% um, increase in, in revenue by making sure that they had a more diverse um, leadership team. So there is a huge benefit not just ethically, not just morally, but also financially for ensuring that there is diversity. And that includes things like diversity of thought and bringing different perspectives to the fore um, and, and how that has such a big benefit to many organizations. So with that in mind, I wanna highlight some of the myths that I hear. I know I already alluded, alluded to the fact that I hear a lot of managers say, I can't find these people, where are they? Where can I find great talent for my organizations? And many companies think that there aren't enough people in the market, but as we can see from some of the data, one in eight individuals in the talent market marketplace, especially in junior positions are F diverse. So actually the disparity is not the availability of talent, it's more about how we are promoting and growing that talent through the different roles. And that's so important to, to highlight. The second is um, there is a skills gap. Candidates don't often have the skills required for senior roles. And that's actually very untrue. Um, there are, like I said before, there are so many colleagues who are looking to progress. You know, they're putting lots of work into growing their skills and capabilities. And what we've seen from research is that British workers from black and ethnically diverse communities actually show high levels of ambition and more than three quarters of black and ethnically diverse individuals describe themselves as ambitious and they say that business and career progression are very important drivers for them in their careers. So there are skill sets there, there is the ambition there, there is the drive there, but unfortunately lots of organizations still have that lack of representation. The third myth is that there are equal opportunities for people of all races and people need to work harder to succeed. And this is the day old um, theory around meritocracy. We all have equal opportunities to succeed. Why aren't people just taking advantage of those opportunities? And unfortunately, there are so many things within organizations systemically that hinder lots of black and ethnically diverse individuals from having um, the progression that they wish to see. So actually one of the things that's very important is to break down some of those barriers to see that progression. So what are some of those barriers? The first is a lack of visible role models. 
many individuals tell us, especially from our Accelerate community, that when I don't see people who look like me in these roles, I don't apply for them because I don't think it's possible. And this is a very important thing to highlight because it's not just for the black and ethnically diverse community, but the intersectional lens is so important. For black and ethnically diverse people who have disabilities, for example, I don't see people with disabilities in, in CEO roles or CFO, uh, CFO roles. And actually what we know from a, a diversity lens more broadly is that um, I think it's something like 50% of all senior leaders with disabilities don't disclose them. So when you start to look intersectionally, there are so many more ways that this becomes a more prevalent issue. When we look at um, women of color, for example, when I don't see women that look like me in these roles, I don't go for them. And then when you add that layer of being a person of color, it makes that gap a lot more prevalent because representation is so low. So there is so much work to be done in this space. The second is a lack of transparency in the hiring process. And I recently saw a stat that something like 40% of roles that are advertised don't actually come onto job boards. So there is so much backdoor hiring that goes on. And um, forgive the, the kind of simplicity in the way that I represent this, but we all know that as individuals, we have inherent, inherent unconscious biases. So if we look at the fact that statistically, more people in senior leadership roles identify as white males. You know, statistically, that, that's, that's where we see representation. So if individuals in those senior positions are hiring people who look like them, unfortunately, this is going to be a continuous cycle. How do we bring more transparency into the hiring process to make sure that all jobs are advertised in the right way to give more individuals the opportunity to, to, to apply for them? We also see a lack of constructive feedback from hiring managers. I see so often from our Accelerate Black Futures community where they say, I really took you know, the courage to apply for a role and I didn't get the role and no one told me why I didn't get it. And unfortunately, as HR professionals, as hiring managers, when we don't share transparency around what does not make a candidate successful, they're not able to utilize that information to grow into the next role. So it becomes a very big kind of endless cycle for many black and ethnically diverse candidates, especially. The fourth is a lack of sponsorship and mentorship. Um, and I've seen more of an emergence from a mentorship standpoint where more individuals are able to go out and identify people because we've talked about it a lot more. But actually sponsors are a lot harder, especially for black and ethnically diverse people to, to tap on the shoulder. Hi, this is a great role. I'd love to think about going for it in the future. Can you help me have a voice in rooms that I can't be in? And unfortunately for a lot of ethnically diverse talent, that is a luxury that they simply don't have. The fifth is a lack of psychological safety or confidence. And actually, I say this with a caveat that this is absolutely not the case for everyone, as is all of the points I've made so far. But there's definitely something we'll come on to later on about a sense of belonging and how actually in some cases individuals who are impacted by other systemic issues, biases, racism, microaggressions that go on for people of their race, that can sometimes knock their psychological safety and confidence in being able to speak up or go for more opportunities because of issues that would have helped them held them back in the past. A couple of other issues we've seen are ineffective performance management processes. So in many cases, we actually do see statistically that individuals who are black and ethnically diverse, unfortunately, do end up for companies where there are um, performance ratings, for example, statistically do end up in the lower end of the scale, which is very frustrating. Um, and, and, that's, and that's the first thing. But the other thing that's important to note is where there is sometimes a culture of ineffective feedback that's given throughout the performance cycle, it then once again creates that endless cycle of colleagues not understanding what they need to do better in their roles and therefore not understanding what they need to do to progress to, to, to future opportunities. And like we saw before, there is a significant proportion of individuals who feel underlooked for, for promotions and opportunities, and this is an underlying catalyst for that. And if there is one thing that many people can take back from this session today is to go and look at your processes, look at your stats, look at the data and what it's telling you across these trends. Because when you do do that, you see the trends, but a lot of people don't look at the data, unfortunately. And then the final point is low level of line manager support for career development. 
most people are not being told by their managers, you should go for this opportunity. Many people um, go into management positions because of their skill and capability in a being able to do the role that they're doing, but not always because of their capability as leaders. So unfortunately, what we have is, once again, um, from a systemic lens, it can then create disparities in how individuals feel supported as they go for, for new opportunities. I've been loving some of the comments that have come through in the chat. Maria Fernandez says, I know it's very sad. I completely um, relate to that, Maria. And it's actually a very difficult job that I do sometimes in talking about these insights. Um, and it's great to hear that, you know, they're resonating with you. Um, and Rosie said, when you cannot hide your characteristic, you are open to bias and discrimination. Absolutely. I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, for example, as a, a colleague who, um, you know, identifies as part of the LGBTQ plus community, that coming out journey can be ver very nerve wracking, but there is always a choice to choose not to come out, right? Whereas when you're a black person, you don't have that option. When you're an Asian person, you don't have that option. And sometimes, unfortunately, um, these characteristics, even though they are protected, um, a lot of people, you know, do, do experience a lot of bias because of how they look. And I'm sure we can agree that that's a very unfair um you know terrible situation and the more we can talk about these things the more we can dispel some of those myths so we're going to move on um to the importance of looking at diversity inclusion equity and belonging as a full construct um so a poll that was conducted by ICM in December 2018 indicated that 57% of people who identify as Black, Asian, or ethnically diverse felt that they had to work harder to succeed because of their ethnicity. And 40% of them say that they earn less or have worse employment prospects for the same reason. And actually, a lot of the work that needs to be done in this space is around belonging, how to make people feel like they belong um, and, and I know a lot of organizations put a lot of effort into diversity. Let's hire more black talent. Let's set targets to hire more Asians, more black people, ethnically diverse people, so that people can look at our website and say, that's a very beautifully diverse looking team. And then, and then they tick the box and then they move on. But unfortunately, the issue that you have is, unless you're able to look at all of these facets hand in hand, you're not able to retain those employees. So you do so much work, hire lots of companies to help you with, with bringing the talent in, but unless they feel included, unless they feel like they belong, and unless you remove the obstacles that stand in their way, there will always be a lack of equity that, that will hold them back. And, and it's important to, to think about belonging because People who experience a sense of belonging, by research, we've been able to see that there is at least a 56% increase in job performance. So it's not just once again, because it's a great idea. And, and, and you know, we look at the moral um, argument, we look at the, the ethical argument, but from a productivity point of view, it's actually in an organization's interest to support colleagues to feel like they belong, to be able to enable them to create the input that they, they need to, to produce that diversity of thought, to then uh, produce that business performance we want to see. They also experience a 50% drop in turnover. So once again, you have a 50% increase in retention rate. You're able to hold on to your talent a lot more and also a 75% reduction in, in sick days. Someone who's been a HR business partner, I'm sure many of you um, in your capacities as HR professionals or leaders know that if there is any win, a reduction in sick, sick leave it is definitely a really important one. And I think to be able to achieve this, allyship is such a great catalyst. All colleagues who are black and ethnically diverse need to feel like the people who do not look like them, not only accept their presence, but embrace their presence and harness their presence and harness their contribution and value it. And how are you able to do that? That's something that we're going to explore shortly. So who is an ally? That's where we'll start. An ally is essentially any person that actively promotes and aspires to advance the culture of inclusion through intentional, positive and conscious efforts that benefit people as a whole. Now, there are a few things I'm going to break down in here. First of all, I love the word actively promotes here. Like I said before, it's not just about being passive in the way that we engage talent, 
but we are taking proactive steps to look at how we support every people every day. And I love that point around aspiration. And, and, and it's important to note here that allyship is not just in the context of race. We can all be allies in different ways. I often say that I highlight the fact that I'm a quarter um, Dutch because even though I grew up from my Ghanaian background, I do understand and appreciate that there is a level of privilege that comes with being um, you know, mixed. Because the experiences I have as a mixed woman are very different to the experiences my mother has as a woman who is black, right? The, 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 the issues, the prejudices she's faced are ones that I probably would not always relate to. So actually, that small level of privilege that I have in comparison is something that I need to use. And many of us feel triggered by the word privilege because we think that it means that we are doing something wrong. And actually, the honest truth is privilege is essentially identifying that you have a characteristic, a background or an opportunity that you can utilize as a stepping stone to help others to, to get up that ladder. And that's why I love that word aspire, because we should all be looking at how we can proactively create opportunities to advance other people. And we should absolutely be intentional about the way we do this. We should be positive, but also really think very consciously about how we can do that in a proactive way. And I love that it talks about benefiting people as a whole, because it's not just in your organization that it makes an impact. I talked about the revenue opportunities from a customer lens, but also there when you create a culture of belonging, it's not one that just benefits the group that feels disenfranchised. It benefits everyone. Because if everybody can bring their best self, that diversity of thought and collaboration that can be created is one that is really beneficial to the whole business. And I can see a lot of people commenting here. So thank you so much for engaging. Um, Daniel Taylor said some organizations are including belonging when they talk about equality, such as equality, diversity, inclusion and belonging. Absolutely. And I think it's a great way to demonstrate intent very early on. MSC says great way to explain privilege. I wish more people would understand what the world, what the word means in this context. I absolutely agree. And I think we all have privileges in some way. Um, so really tapping into it, whatever that looks like is so important. So thank you. Um, we've also got something from Harry that says, I think it's a beautiful way of putting it. There is a huge connotation that privilege is negative, but like the narrative of using it, it is an opportunity. Absolutely, Harry. And I'm glad that that's resonating um, across everyone. So thank you all so much. Please do keep the comments coming. So we've talked about what allyship is. How can we demonstrate this in a meaningful way? And I love sharing this model, which is called the Ally Continuum um, by Jennifer Brown. She's the founder of the Jennifer Brown Consultancy, which is based out of New York. And she always says that it's important when we think about our allyship journey that we think of it as a bit of a continuum. So we're all at different stages of our allyship journeys. And the first that we'll start with is, is apathetic. Essentially, there are many people who are at a stage where they don't understand the issues. And in the context that we just talked about with privilege, that is okay, right? We're all learning about different topics as we go along and we all have to start from somewhere. So being at the first stage is not to say that it's a negative thing, but being aware of the fact that there is so much more that we have to do to understand the issues is a great starting point and leaning into that can be very beneficial. And usually people are at this at this stage um, would maybe not be outwardly racist or sexist or homophobic um, or anything like that, but they may not necessarily see the world through a broad lens of different experiences. They may only look at the world from a lens of their own perspective, right? So um, you might often say people, you might often hear people say, especially the comment I raised earlier around, but you know, the world is meritocratic. People can just work hard and, and get to where they need to go. And actually that's just a demonstration of a lack of understanding that there are some individuals who do not have the opportunity to succeed like everybody else. And sometimes you just don't know that until you can um, experience that at, at a deeper, uh, a deeper um, depth. The second stage is aware. And this is when most people will have an understanding of the issues. They may have been aware, they might have read a book, they may have watched some documentaries and um, essentially can understand what the lived experience of other individuals are. 
and and I think what's important about this stage is how how important it is for us to lean in, ask questions, be curious, we seek to fully understand, but also removing our ego from the equation because our egos often prevent us from being able to fully immerse ourselves in other people's lived experiences. So almost taking yourself and what you already know out of the equation and learning new things that help you to develop a new level of understanding and empathy are so important to be able to create more awareness about the help that can be offered to other people as an ally. The third is active, and this is essentially people who have awareness of the issues can create a level of empathy for the lived experiences of people and are now trying to unlearn old, old habits and old um, understandings. Um, people who are in the active stage are typically well informed and they're seeking diversity when prompted. And I, I want to pick on that point prompted. It was interesting. I was in a session recently where a leader said something like, I feel really passionate about the DNI agenda and I do stuff about it at work all the time. And my wife walked into the room one day and heard me on a conference call about DNI. And when I hung up, she looked at me and said, I've never heard you talk about that at home before. And I've never heard you talk about that at the pub. <laughs> and he said, wow, that really prompted me to realize that at work, I'm prompted to think about DNI all the time. And I thought I was an activist, but I realized I'm an activist at work. And actually, I don't challenge my friends on the race agenda. I don't challenge um, people in my private life about how they could think about this differently. And I loved seeing that light bulb moment because for many activists, we work really hard to create an understanding. We are well informed, but that piece around being prompted is such a big piece here. Are we thinking more about areas where it may not come naturally um, to talk about um, inclusion, especially on the race agenda? And, and, and how comfortable are we talking about it in the presence of those who are unconverted? And I think those are kind of big questions that start to come up in your mind um, when you're in that active stage. And then the fourth is advocate. So these are individuals who are committed and proactively championing allyship. And I, I love, I love that this is almost the kind of stage we would all love to get to. But once again, this is by no means <laughs> setting a state of utopia. It's really important that we also understand that you may take a step forward in that, in that um, kind of allyship phase and maybe take a step back. We talked about the intersectional lens. And there might be times when you feel really confident talking about the ethnically diverse agenda, but it might be that when you start to look at what experiences are, for example, for ethnically diverse gay people, you might realize, oh, actually, I need to go back and raise more awareness. And it's appreciating that sometimes you can go back and forth between that continuum, and that's also okay. But I think the important piece to highlight around advocating is essentially this is a place where people are proactively making it happen every single day. And what I love about it is the feeling of not feeling threatened and understanding that there is an opportunity to use privilege and power to be able to create process changes, policy changes as professionals in the HR space, as professionals, as leaders, there is so much opportunity to really make a change in this space. And essentially advocating is a great opportunity to do that as an ally. And, and, and I, I kind of want to end this specific section by saying moving through this ally continuum is one that takes perseverance and dedication. Everybody will make mistakes along the way. Everybody will say the wrong things along the way. But it's so important that we open ourselves to the discomfort that comes with learning, you know, and understand, especially when you're in a position of privilege that an uncomfortable scenario talking about someone else's lived experience is a lot less horrible than being in that lived experience. So we often talk about George Floyd's murder. George Floyd is no longer here. That's a very horrible incident where a man doesn't get the opportunity to live to talk about it. So being uncomfortable talking about his murder is a lot less uncomfortable than his lived experience. You know, people who can't, I was talking to a gentleman just this week who said, I can't walk on the street with my hoodie up, right? So imagine the discomfort of living that experience versus the discomfort of talking about it. 
there are definitely two very distinct differences there. And I think the important thing is also being intentional about putting yourself in new situations where you can grow um, so that we can create a better world where everybody feels valued and respected. And, and before I move on to my final tips, I can see that a few comments have come through. Um, I love this one from Harry that says, ever since stepping into a career in DNI, it's prompted me to revise my way of thinking in all other aspects of my life. I can't now watch a film without questioning and exploring the diversity of the casting or going to the gay village in Manchester and being upset about seeing black and trans communities not feeling welcome. I absolutely love that, Harry. And I think that's a great um, example of the importance of going from active to advocating. And I can really see how you're making that pivot there. And that's really great to see. Um, I love the point you, you, you made about watching a film. My husband is very tired of me talking about just, you know, Love Island, for example, which is meant to be lighthearted and say, he shouldn't have spoke to that woman like that. That's not, um, you know, that's not feminist or, um, you know, that's not a good way to advocate for people. But it's just a really good sign of awareness and, and being able to see where there are disparities. So it's great to see you, you talk about that. Thanks, everyone. Um, so just to kind of finalize on a few tangible tips, we've got about six minutes left before we open up for Q&A. So please do start to get your questions through um, via chat. But I put together a list of five very practical things that allies are able to do no matter what capacity they're in. So if anybody talks about um, DNI or the ethnically diverse talent piece in any sphere of influence at all, if someone asks, what can I do to champion this agenda forward? please do wrap out this slide because it's a really simple way of articulating practical things that people can do. So the first is sponsorship, right? Thinking about within your sphere of influence, are there individuals who could really, really utilize your support in getting through some of those doors? And how can you do that for them? And I, I always say my co-founder and I for Accelerate, one of our biggest motivations for starting what we started is that we could not have been where we are right now in our careers without white allies who really put their careers on the line to support us. And I could list those individuals by name today over the span of my career because all of those individuals have meant the world to me in the difference and the change they've been able to make in my life. And you can't underestimate the power that comes with saying, actually, I could help this person in some way, even if it's a small way, to really make a difference. And that sponsorship piece is right at the top of that list. The second is calling out unacceptable behavior and microaggressions. And I have a personal story about this. Um, I was once um, on an interaction where someone, let's just say, didn't have a very positive exchange with me. <laughs> and another person on the call heard about this and spoke to a leader in, the, in their business and said, I just witnessed a very uncomfortable exchange and I think something needs to be done. And that white male managing director called the individual who essentially utilized um, unacceptable language and prompted them to, to, to give a call with an apology. And I shared this very personal story to say that that individual then called me and said, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize the impact of my actions and how they would have made you feel. And it's interesting because I'd never articulated how I felt to anyone. But what that showed me is the power of allyship in being able to understand, actually, I'm in a position here that can influence somebody else. And how do I use my voice in a way that brings positive change? And as a result of that, I've been able to, to create a very positive relationship with that individual. So it just goes to, to show the power of an ally in a situation that can be very strongly emotive in breaking down some of those boundaries and, and creating engagement. So that's so important. Um, it's important to also ch challenge your own biases and entrenched beliefs. We all have them. And to really think about what new beliefs you can utilize to replace those. And, and educating yourself is so important in that space. Um, and, and that could be through talking to individuals from ethnically diverse communities about what things have propelled their careers and what has slowed them down. Um, 
but equally reading books. I love YouTube as a resource for being able to watch videos. Everything we need to know now is available in a way that is so easy to access that we should absolutely utilize the opportunities to take ownership of that learning. And then the final thing here is to recognize the diversity that exists within the ethnically diverse community. So the black experience is not the same for every single black person. The Asian experience is not the same for every Asian person. And like I said, there are intersects. So it might be that an individual who is a person of color from, um, from let's say a working family or is a carer will be very different to someone who isn't. So really recognize individuals as people and their own individual complex challenges that they bring to the fore. And then finally, I'm mindful that many of you are HR professionals and hiring managers on this call. So what can you do practically in your roles to make a difference? And the first is improve representation on talent programs and succession plans. Do you have the data on self-identification for individuals? In which case, how do you overlay that with your talent list, your performance list, and see how are ethnically diverse people represented on those programs, represented on those performance ratings, and what does the data trends tell you? Audit your HR processes and analyze the trends for systemic bias and racism. If your data is telling you that Asian colleagues are usually at the bottom end of that performance scale or black colleagues are at the bottom end of that performance scale, no one needs to tell you that there is a big issue there around line managers and the way that they're um, um, rating their, their colleagues. Um, the third is placing an anti-racist lens on all policies. So many people will look at an anti-racism policy, launch it and take the box and they're really happy. But actually think about what policies are not necessarily conducive to dealing with other racism and bias issues that exist across other policies? The fourth is improving racial diversity on your candidate slates and giving meaningful feedback to every applicant. I appreciate this isn't easy. I appreciate that this is time consuming, but think about the cost of losing talent to other organizations because you didn't get this right. And actually think about the productivity cost for being able to support people to grow internally. And then the final one is increased transparency on open roles and minimizing hiring through the back door. So ensuring that every single role within your business is advertised and making sure that you're tapping into talent pools for them. Um, so that's, that's it from me in terms of my content. I'm just quickly looking through some of these comments. Um, I can see that there is there's been a couple of resources that have been shared between each other, which is amazing. So please do continue to tap into each other and the resources that you shared. Um, but equally, I do post all the time on um, diversity issues on my um, LinkedIn page. So I would love for anyone to, to follow me um, or connect with me on LinkedIn um, to continue the conversation there. So I'll pop my link in um, in the chat at some point, um, but it'd be great to, to hear from you. So I'll hand back over to Sam, if that's all right. Thank you so much, Winnie. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm hoping that everyone got a number of takeaways from being in, able to actually hear what is quite pressing. And what I like what you said, Winnie was this one of the things that I come across as well is the ability to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable so you said here living it and talking it is very very different now there are a number of individuals that I see in diversity and inclusion that I've been asked to talk about their lived experiences a lot and it is trauma it is got reliving trauma but the good thing about it is it's allowing individuals to have the experience. So I really like that you shared that. Please bear in mind when people are sharing with their lived experiences as well, that it is trauma. And you said here, putting yourself in positions where everyone feels valued and respected. That, that's everybody. So I like that you commented here that it benefits people as a whole. This is for everyone. This includes allies, it includes black ethnic men. It, it's everyone's gonna benefit from this. It, it, it's, it's a no brainer, it's a win-win. So I would just like to just share 
um, the member benefits of being part of the CIPD. So as you can probably see, there's a whole host on there and we have access to resources, which Rebecca has kindly already shared in the chat. I would just say as well that there is opportunities if you'd like them to join ourselves and join the membership, please go and have a look at the website. Rebecca's just put that in there and Stephen may have put that in there already. I also just want to just highlight and just, let me just move on the slide. Can we just move the slide? Then, yeah. So I just want to also just highlight career support that is available for anyone that needs it. That on the CIPD website, we do have career support that is, you know, you can tap into at any point. There's a lot of free resources there. You do not need to be a member, but then there's a membership side of it, which means that you get access to everything that's there too. I have benefited myself and I'm sure that there are individuals who are part of the CIPD on this call who have also done the same. Can I go to the next slide as well? So the next, events so the next events my screen is not there we go so the next event is the 2nd of february at six o'clock is unwrapping l d if anyone wants to join that is going to be a fantastic event the 7th of february at 6 30 is the hr book club which is going to be flexible working with Gemma dale the author we have Emma Clayton, who's running those sessions they're brilliant for those who just want to build their knowledge bank this is the way of getting your CPD. I am very active in that HR book club. I've learned a ton and being able to tap into the authors themselves, they come along and actually allow and share, you know, a lot of stuff of how they came about it. The 25th of March, let me just confirm that that date has now changed to the 31st of March. There's going to be a diversity round table, which includes top expert speakers. So it's going to be another session, but it's going to be a panel one. Now, all of these are going to be shared in the link that we send out later on, which will include this, um, which will include this slide and the recording. So I would really recommend that you take the time to have a look at what's on offer for you. I believe that's the last slide. Can I just double check? Oh, feedback. So before you go, I know that this is your lunch hour and you've probably, you know, been munching while you've been listening. But if you just take some time to feedback in, it'd be great for Winnie as well to just to see that this has been useful, but for us to make sure we're able to give you the best talkers and speakers that, you know, that time in your time. So just can you highlight the QR code and access the survey? And we'll also be taking away, if you just put one word in, into the chat that you've got from today, that would be brilliant. Just one word, that would be amazing. And we'll take that away as well. So hopefully you got the QR code. And I think the next slide is... Our speaker, again, just to say, Winnie Anna Forson, she's available on LinkedIn. We will be sharing her LinkedIn if it's not already gone into the chat. If you want to, please do connect. Mine as well is going to be shared. My name is Samantha Lubanzu, available on LinkedIn. We'll share these um, resources with you. And to go onto the site, it's www.cipd.co.uk. I want to thank our team, Rebecca, Stephen and Emma who have all been helping in the background, they are incredible. Can't really do any of this without them, to be honest. So I just wanna say thank you very, very, very much. And again, Winnie, um, if you don't mind just coming back on, I'm gonna just pin you. I just wanna say a big thank you. It allows me to pin it. Yeah. If anyone just wants to put on their screen, it'd be great if we can get a, a final picture. So I just wanna pop your, your videos on and we'll, it'll be great if anyone can just smile to say I am an ally and um, we can post you there on social media. The more the merrier. Anyone just wanna put your, your pictures on, videos, wanna see lovely faces. Oh, I'm loving all these lovely faces. As soon as we've got the whole screen filled up, we will take a lovely snap. <laughs> Hi, David. I wish we could see everybody on the full, on the one screen. We're on two pages now, which is yeah, it's been brilliant to have so many of 
every, so many people join. Any more people want to put their videos on so we can fill the screen? On my screen, I can see a couple more. But if you've got a screen one, I'm going to take a picture now. See if I can do this with, yeah, there we go. Big wave, everybody. Everyone do a wave. <laughs> Brilliant. And finally, if there's any more feedback or questions, don't think this is the end. It's, we, this is momentum. We want to continue this. Please share them. Please email back to myself, Rebecca, the team. at. Um, we're going to put in that email address into the chat as well. We're here to continue the conversation. This doesn't end today. We're continuing the momentum. Once again, thank you, Winnie, uh, for your, this is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guest speaking talk that you've done. So we've got five more minutes. So I want to give you those five minutes back. So anyone that wants to uh, either put some more things in the chat, that's fine. Winnie will be able to communicate with you. Or otherwise, I want to say enjoy the rest of your lunch, all five minutes of it for, for me <laughs> or for anyone else. And just thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Lovely to see that there are so many people still with us. If anybody wants to, to chat with us, put your cameras on. Or oh, you can use the chat function. Yeah, we're happy to. With either. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say there are a couple of questions and comments yeah. in the chat that we will pass forward because I think there isn't time perhaps to address yeah. them. I think um, there was one from... Rosie, I don't know if Rosie's still on. I did notice one from Aziza, and I've gone back to that one, and mm -hmm. I can I can still see Aziza is still on. I mean, I'm happy to quickly take those for the five minutes we have if if they okay. wanted to stay. There are a those. couple from Harry as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> very quick. What I'll do is I'll go through the ones I can see in in the order. So Aziza, I think you raised a really good point there. I just wanted to highlight that the session is specifically about allyship and what allies can do in this space. But I think you're absolutely right. It's so important that we don't just think about what um um you know people of different ethnicities can do. This is absolutely a broader societal issue, and we should always think um, more broadly across all races about what we can do. So I think that's a really good call out. Um, uh, and then I think we had, apologies, I'm trying to scroll as fast as I can. I'll read one here that someone... I can see, um, which says, how do, we Sorry. how do we diversify our recruitment drive in a predominantly white male industry? And that's from Sarah Kern. Sarah. Brilliant. Hi, Sarah. No, I think that's a really great question. So what we've seen so far um, over the last maybe two years is more of a stronger emergence in organizations that are focusing specifically on recruiting ethnically diverse talent. I think um, more than ever in the wake of the tragic murder of George Floyd, I think what's, what I've seen happen is that there is more of an emergence around special um, or specialist organizations that are focusing on industry. So, for example, there is... Um, um, one called uh, Black Women in Asset Management, there is Black Women in HR, um, and, and those are just two specifically for Black individuals, but there are so many people of colour um, groups and, and emerging platforms that are now looking at specific recruitment um, of ethnically diverse talent in specific industries. I recommend it's so important to tap into those. Um, I think data is really key here in looking at your candidate slates and what individuals are coming through those slates, but also looking at the tip off points, the, the drop off points for those slates too. So some, some companies have told us that they see a trend that they don't have an issue with bringing in applicants from ethnically diverse groups, but maybe from the second stage where human intervention then gets involved, so even bl blind recruitment is great, but from the point you see a human in the process, they see tail off rates because of unconscious bias. Um, so looking at your data will really help you to see, is it an attraction issue? In which case work with specialist groups. 
Is it an issue of dropping off throughout the process, in which case then your managers are the problem? So I, I think that's that's probably the advice I would give and what I've seen work well, but we're still absolutely learning every day across the industry. Um, okay. Um, I think <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, we also have um, a couple of questions going further back that I found um, that were Harry's. Um, so the first one was around, what do you think is the best way to encourage more people to speak up against discrimination in larger companies? There may be some people who are happy to speak up, but unfortunately, some people aren't confident enough to challenge someone. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, look, on a human level, it goes down to the point around if it's uncomfortable to speak about something, think about how uncomfortable it is. For the person who's experienced the issue so there is so much an organization can do which i'll come to and what organizations can do but at a human level this is an individual problem and almost putting that perspective on the experience of an individual versus the privilege that we have as a witness to that issue and how we can help speak up to something that we're not individually experiencing in terms of the organization and what they can do to help speak up spaces are so important um, and I've seen a huge rise in more organizations starting to look at speak up groups or maybe speak up champions um, to go and confidentially raise issues, which I think can be um, something that can be a start. Um, also creating policies that protect individuals that raise those issues. So I've seen a huge rise in microaggression policies, policies um, to encourage anti-racism that's always a great way to be able to, to 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 help but i also talked about looking at the racism element of existing policy so your whistleblowing policy for example should include a point in there around microaggressions and racism to protect people from that context as well but i think organizations can do a lot actually what can individuals do because regardless of what a company does equally we are people right and we need to do what's humanly right um and I think Rosie had a question, have I seen any improvements since the EDI boom of 2020? There have been many EDI booms. <laughs> um, and I think like with anything, we take the opportunities that that brings, but I think it's gonna be a continuous effort. Has there been some improvement? There is definitely more dialogue. Um, from what I see across all the organizations I speak to, material change is still needing a lot of work. I know we're bang on one. Um, was, was there one more question from Harry? Yeah, there was another one. Um, he said that they're setting up employee networks, but they had some hesitations around separating different groups based on background. So for example, black right. community, Asian community, because some employees mm -hmm. feel this would make people feel categorized and excluded if they didn't identify. Yeah. Um, I think, with all employee networks or employee resource groups, it's down to the groups and what they choose to create as a level of affinity. So if groups want to create those groups, then I think they should exist. Where you can promote um, and, and I guess avoid those issues is thinking about how you bring them together to avoid silos. Um, one of the things I've seen done in organizations is putting them on things like leadership um, meetings to help influence and bring a voice to broader organizational conversations. Um, I've seen um, different organizations bring their ERGs together to have joint events to create more intersectionality in the lens that things are looked at. But most organizations will typically allow colleagues to create their own ERGs, in which case the company should really lean into what their colleagues are telling them they need from those ERGs rather than forcing what they think is the right thing on them. And I think that's where it can be tricky with ERGs. It's a very fine balance between hearing the colleague voice, creating an environment where they can be intersectional in approach and 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 create that more, like kind of group dialogue. Um, but ultimately that should be the autonomy that the ERGs have in creating a sense of belonging that they want to. So it's a very, very fine balance. I okay. think that was all the